morning. Can we uh, settle down, take our seats as we prepare for worship this morning? Thank you. Bless the Lord. One or two people away on holiday, one or two people poorly, but we're in God's house, aren't we? Will you stand with me? We're going to pray. We've got Sam with us this morning. Bless the Lord. And uh, I'll just have a sense. You know, last Sunday morning, was, we had, it was a hard slog, wasn't it? Not because God wasn't here, but I believe the enemy was trying to push in and, and try and rob us of our, of our joy. But this morning, we determined, don't we, to worship the Lord and to give him the best that we've got to give him. So let's just pray. Let's set the tone right from the beginning that we choose, regardless of what has happened to us this week, what we've gone through, that we choose to praise the Lord, that we choose to lift him up high, that we choose to push back the darkness, that we choose to trust his word more than we trust the BBC and the ITV. Amen. That God is on our side, and if God is for us this morning, let's declare, who can be against us? Who can be against us? So, Father, this morning, would you release your presence among us, we pray, that signs, wonders, and miracles will follow the preaching of the word. But, Lord, as we worship you, you promise that if we will lift you up, that you'll draw all men unto yourself. And so we give you the glory, we give you the praise, and we give you the honor this morning. We love you, Jesus. We just give you the praise, Lord. We give you the honor. We give you the glory. We lift your name up high, Lord. You are worthy of all of our praise. Hallelujah. Thanks, Sam Bush, mate. Well, good morning, folks. It's nice to be here again. I love worship leading with you guys. And uh, Yeah, I just want to encourage you, really, that um, something that was on my mind is that often we can come to Sunday mornings as uh, a bit like a filling up for the week ahead, you know, like when you get the word and, and all that. But... I really feel like it's also a celebration of the past week. And we don't realize just how good God's been sometimes. We don't realize who he saved us from. What's, what's you know, anything could have happened to us. Kind of. We don't know what he's done, the, the provisions that he makes for us. The fact that we wake up every morning, you know, he gives us breath in our lungs. Today is a celebration. Whether you see it or not, he's been good to you. So good. His grace is so sufficient in all of our weaknesses. Amen. And just the encouragement that, um, as we were praying earlier on in uh, John 15, um, when Jesus says that, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so even praise and worship this morning, we need his presence. We can't strive our way into his presence, can we? We can't do anything of ourselves in that sense. But all we can do is respond to his goodness. And as we respond, it's like he can't hold himself back from us. He loves us so much and he's already here. You might not feel him, but he is here. And he promised us that. Amen. So come on, let's let's worship. So before we sing other people's songs, I want to encourage you, even if you don't sing, even if you're completely tone deaf, who cares? Let's just worship him because he's worthy. You don't need any reason. He's worthy. So let's just worship. Come on. Oh, there's no one like you, Jesus. There's no one like you. Oh, you have sustained us. You've forgiven us every day. Your blood is still washing over us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worthy of a new song every morning. Worthy of a new song. again I love you of 
God, I love your voice. I love your voice. Oh, you have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. long 
to breathe the air of heaven where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity Join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice and a thousand generations. Sing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And on that day, and on that day, he joined the resurrection. Stand beside the heroes of the faith, and with one voice and a thousand generations, who see where the still
good Jesus, you are holy is the Lord. Yes, Jesus. Holy is the sing worthy. Jesus, you are holy. Is the Lord says you you mark your days by how you feel you mark your days by what you've gone through you mark your days by experiences that have elated you and experiences that have dragged you down but I want you this morning to focus on the fact that I am an eternal God and the days that you have lived and the circumstances you've gone through are just but a flash in the pan compared to what I have prepared for you have I not promised that I'd go prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you, then I'm going to come back and take you to be with me where I am. Had I not promised that in my father's house are many rooms, and if it were not so, I would have told you. Had I not told you that I have an eternal purpose for you. Did I not save you, not just for now, but for eternity? So in the light of what you're standing, in the light of what you're going through, rejoice in this, says the Lord your God. I will never leave you or forsake you. A day will come when you will stand with the redeemed of the Lord and they will sing as they return unto Zion and everlasting joy will be upon their heads. And I, you will be with me and I will be with you forever and ever, says the Lord your God. Time to rejoice. Time to break free of the bonds of this earth. This earth will let you down. Its politicians will let you down. Its peoples will let you down. But the Lord your God is on your side and he is a valiant warrior and he is fighting for you today. So rejoice and be glad that it's not about just the moment that you live in, but it's about eternity that I've prepared for you, says the Lord. Hallelujah.
your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never, you promise. Oh. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still.
the Lord. He has been faithful, hasn't he? Throughout the histories of the church history, the songs that have come forth over generations and generations, there's been a recurring theme of his love, of his goodness, and his faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, oh God, my Father. It's not a shadow of turning in me. We believe you can do it again, don't we? Bless the Lord. Father, if you come around your word now, would you just open our ears, open our hearts, that we might receive of the good things of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Haven't they done a great job this morning and just uh, leading us to the Lord and focusing on God's faithfulness to us. Bless the Lord. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. We're in the book of 2 Corinthians, as you know, and we're in chapter 6 this morning. God overtook me a little bit last week, and we didn't really get through most of the stuff I had to say. And... Um, I feel, I feel a tenderness here this morning, and, and I believe that you've, we've come to receive, haven't we? So, you know, that you're, you're, my propensity to preach is dependent on your propensity to receive from God. So my prayer this morning is you just open up your hearts and, and let God speak to you really, really strongly. Well, from 2 Corinthians in chapter 6, it's a really simple word of encouragement from the apostle, but it's something that as Christians very often we miss. Isn't it sometimes the simple things we get wrong? We try and make it all very, very complicated, and it's not that as complicated as we make it out to be. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. He says, in the time of my favour, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you now, it is the time of God's favour. Now is the day of salvation. Do we believe that today? That now is the day of salvation. That while Jesus is still in heaven, we have an opportunity to share the gospel into this community and beyond and see people transformed. Nothing to do with us, but everything to do with Jesus. Amen. And his wonderful gift on the cross. So we've been looking at the teaching of Paul, haven't we? He's been teaching us that we've got this treasure in jars of clay. We're just clay pots this morning and I have something of the goodness of God in us. We've been looking about the fact that we're in an earthly tent. It's like we're on a pilgrimage. This is not home. We're pass, passing through, as one of the hymn writers has said before. And then last week, we looked a little bit about this. We are ambassadors for Christ, that God is making his appeal through us to the world. And then this morning, I want us to look about being God's co-workers. He didn't say that I'm the master and you're the slaves, which is quite interesting. He didn't say, I'm the boss and you're the employees. He said, we are co-workers together with God. Now, we managed to get Joel out of bed before 12 o'clock yesterday, and we went to Ikea. And um, we went to look for a desk for him. And I noticed one of the ladies on the back had, put, had got on her sweatshirt, co-worker. It means that she works with other people, and they work together, and they do things together in order to get the best. God wants us to work with him this morning. Not just for him, but with him. And there is a real, really big difference. And that's what I want to unpack to you this morning, that we are fellow workers with God. And what a privilege it is when you think about it, that God wants us to work with him. So when there are sick people around, he wants us to play our part in laying hands on them and declaring words of faith and believing in our heart. And then the Holy Spirit brings Jesus into that situation. We're co-workers together with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus. And then healing takes place. We don't do the healing, do we? But our co-worker, the Holy Spirit, does it. Amen? As we share the gospel with people, as we, in the office or wherever we might find ourselves this week, and we just share a word, we're playing our part, but our co-worker, the Holy Spirit, will then bring conviction, open the eyes of people, and bring Jesus to people. It's really, really important that we understand that we are working together with God. You know, as I'm preaching here, this is just not oratory. I'm not that good. But the anointing of the Holy Spirit is upon me. So what I've l looked at this week, what I've written down on my notes, what I'm sharing with you now, is now being energized by the co-worker of the Holy Spirit who is revealing Jesus and his purposes to us. Isn't that wonderful? That's why preaching is not just a sort of the thing that we do on a Sunday morning because it's a good idea and it's educational. It should be impartational, shouldn't it? Because it's not me. It's the words that I am saying now being energized by the Holy Spirit that is making Jesus real in our hearts. We're to working together with him, not apart from him. Isn't that wonderful? And you know, I believe that church has made an impact, not made an impact as it should, because we've not worked with Jesus. See, what we've done is said, right, let's see what we can do to attract people to church. 
And then we've created things that we thought were really good and actually were really rubbish. And then what we've done then, he's gone and prayed about it because we're really spiritual and said, God, can you just bless what we've put together? Instead of saying to the Holy Spirit, what are you doing? Can I get involved? That's where we need to be, not making things up to feel better about ourselves, but actually working with God. I've said it so many times from this pulpit. We, we make a plan and then go and pray about it and say, God bless our plan. That's the most stupid thing we could ever have done. If we hear the voice of God and get the plan from heaven, it will be blessed already. We won't have to beg God for his blessing because if we do what he's doing and say what he's saying, just like Jesus did, God will begin to break through in a way that we didn't do, see him do before. And, and this is the problem in church. That it goes down two ways. Either we make a plan and ask God to bless it, so we really kind of leave him out until the, end, the last time when it doesn't work, or we get really, really, really the other way. And I'm, and I'm not going to use theological terms, but some people are real almost fatalists. Like if God wants to do it, God can do it. I'll just sit here and wait for God to show up. That's not the teaching of the Bible. We haven't got to do it and ask God to bless it. We haven't got to sit there waiting for God to do it. We have got to work with the Lord in order to see his purposes fulfilled. He's called us into, into plans and purposes. He's got stuff for us to do, hasn't he? And, and there's a mandate upon us. Do you know what? We have got a job description. And there's a couple of scriptures I want to read to you. This is our job description. And this is what the Lord asks of us as he was leaving this earth, as he had modelled out what it was to walk with God and co-labour with his Father. He says these things to his disciples because he wants them to do exactly the same. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptise them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's Matthew 28. Mark 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. As you read Mark's gospel in particular, there's a real focus on Jesus being rabbi. They always call him rabbi, teacher. And that was not an uncommon thing in those days. Obviously, the, the Jewish rabbis would take a group of young men and disciple them and train them and, and teach them how to pray and how to do the things that the Lord had commanded them. And Jesus gathers a similar bunch around him. But he is the super rabbi. He's the one that's been sent from God. And every time you read the scriptures, you see them watching him and getting involved with him. He does some miracles and he sends them out and they come back rejoicing because they're now doing the miracles. He's teaching them to do exactly what he's doing, which is to work with the Father, to co-labor with God. And he commissions them and they go out and they do all sorts of things. And you know, as we, as we read about Jesus, he says this, I tell you the truth, it means he's not lying to us. <laughs> I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing of himself. That's like us making a plan. Try to ask God to bless you. I can't do nothing of myself. He can only do what he sees the Father doing because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. I think we've overcomplicated it in church. We've tried to kind of like, well, we'll go this way and if, if Australia comes up with a mega church solution, we'll read that book and then we'll listen to this preacher from America and we'll do this and we'll do that. We just need to look what God is doing in our community, what he's doing in our lives, what he's doing in our heart, what he's doing in our quiet times, and just get involved with it, don't we? And so we should never as a church think, oh, down the road they're doing this, that, and the other. Our big question is, Lord, what are you doing here in Sedgley? Can I get involved in it? That is the big question, really, and that's what we need to do. We need to co-work with God just like Jesus did. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9, we are God's fellow workers. That is absolutely mind-blowing. But partnership is something that God has created us for. He created man in his image and his likeness so that we might work together with him. He created the heavens and the earth and he said to man, look, I want you to go and perpetuate what I've been doing. I want you to keep on doing more of what I've been doing. I want you to co-labor with me. It was never God's intention for there to be sickness, death, decay and destruction and everything we're seeing right now was never the heart of God. God wants us to work with him and to live in a place of paradise and one day he's going to take us to be with himself, isn't he? But until that day, we keep on co-laboring with him. 
As God's fellow workers, he says, or co-workers, we urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. What, what is he meaning by that, the, receive the grace of God in vain? Well, it's obviously in connection with co-labouring. So I think what he's really saying here is this. We can be saved, but we can miss the incredible privilege of serving with Jesus. We can, we can know that we're going to heaven. We can come to church every week and yet never enter into some of those incredible experiences that God has got for us. If you think about Jesus and his disciples, the amount of time he just spent with them, you know, wouldn't you want to be with Jesus if he was here right now? Well, he's living in our, on the inside of us by his Holy Spirit, and we can continue to do the things that Jesus did and his disciples did. And I am absolutely convinced that somehow we have got it wrong because the, the problem is not in heaven's part. He's commissioned us, he's anointed us, and I think sometimes we just sit around waiting for him, and he's waiting for us. And then he goes on to say this, in the time of God's favour, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. You know, God puts graces upon our lives to serve and to work with him. It doesn't leave us destitute every one of us was born with purpose with giftings with things that God has placed in our hearts sometimes we belittle them and feel that we're not as good as anybody else God's not asking you to be as good as anybody today he's asking you to do what he's asking you to do and again I could draw you as I do very often to the parable of the talents it's not about how much you've got it's what you do with what you have got and actually the more that we do with what we've got gives us greater opportunity as we exercise a gift, it becomes stronger and bigger. And God wants us to work with him, and he's given us the abilities to be able to do things to him. And, you know, Paul goes on to teach us that, you know, in Corinthians about being the body of Christ and all being different parts. You know, some being an hand, some being an ear, some being a, an eye, some being a pain on the backside. No, 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 no. Uh, but, but there's all sorts of places that we are serving in the body of Christ. But, you know what, regardless of whatever part of your body is doing right now it's all connected back to your brain and as, as a corporate body we learn to serve together but I want to say you need to learn to serve as an individual as well sometimes we let the church do everything and oh I'm part of the church therefore I'm functioning no you need as an individual member of this church to function with the graces and the callings that God has placed upon your life and there's no reason for anybody to sit here saying well I haven't got a job I don't know what I should be doing if you don't come and see me because there are things for us to get involved in. And I'm not just talking about putting the tea and coffee out. There's, there's greater stuff to be done. And I think sometimes we miss it by a long, long way. In the time of God's favour, I heard you. In the day of God's salvation, I helped you. Have you noticed sometimes when you ask God to do something, to move, to change a circumstance or a situation, he says, okay, you do it. That's frustrating, isn't it? We pray for God to bring somebody in to do this, and then he says, no, you do it. Because all the time, he wants to get us involved. There is no room in the church of Jesus Christ for passivity. He wants us all to be involved in the Great Commission. He wants us all to be involved in functioning as part of this body and doing what he's asking us to do. So we just need to get on with it. And sometimes when we pray, say, oh, God, will you do this? Will you do that? He's saying, okay, I'll do it, but let's do it together. I think we've missed out sometimes because God's asked us to do stuff. And people are waiting on the other side of our obedience, you know. It's not that God is not willing. It's not that we haven't got the graces upon our lives to be able to fulfill what he's asked us to do. But we've just not taken the steps to do what he's asked us to do. And I do wonder sometimes how many opportunities I have personally missed by waiting on God in, instead of understanding that God was waiting upon me to take some steps of faith, to actually push out into the deep and do something different. And here are the two key words. He hears us and then he helps us. God has heard our cries this morning. He's heard our prayers. We sung it. When, when we get to heaven, every song that we've sang with tears rolling down our faces, declaring he's faithful even though we can't even feel it or sense it in our moment will be worth every minute. Every prayer that we've prayed is going to be worth it. He hears our prayers, but also he's here to help us, but some of that help means that we have to do it ourselves, that we have to get involved. And I was thinking about, at the prayer meeting 
the guys read a story, uh, and I was thinking about that even before they did that on Tuesday, is when Jesus is on the seashore, and the disciples have only just got to know him really a little bit, and he, he, he's, he's just watched them come in, and they've had a really rough night of it. They've been out fishing all night, and the word of God says they caught nothing, which is bad news for them, because to catch nothing means they've got no income, because they can only live on what they catch. And they caught nothing that night, so they got nothing to sell at the market. So Peter and the guys are pretty downcast, and they're cleaning out the nets because they know they've got to clean them for the next night. Because again, they've got to next night got to go out and do it again. And so they've been working through the night. I'm getting some Peter's cleaning that net, cursing under his breath that he didn't catch any fish. He's thinking about his bed. He's thinking about his bacon and egg sandwich and his cup of tea when he gets home. He's not thinking really about anything at all. And then Jesus comes and he said, Peter. I want you to push out again and cast down your nets. And sometimes, don't you feel like that, that you've, you've done loads and loads of stuff and the Lord says, will you just do it again? And you think to yourself, oh, I just cannot be bothered. I just want to go home and sleep. Will somebody just give me a break here? I, I, we've done that in church 20, 30, 40,000 times before and it's not worked. But you know what Peter says? Because you say so. I believe God is asking us to re-engage again because he says so. Not because we're pretty clever at it and not because we were pretty successful at it before. But I'm asking you again to re-engage with the purposes of God. There is no need in grumbling that people don't get healed if we don't lay hands on them. When the Bible commissions us to do that. No good grumbling that people don't get saved if we don't share the good news with them and go into all the world and preach the gospel. And you say, oh, well, we, 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 that's just old preaching, Steve. We've done all of that before. This is the word of God. And because he says so, we're going to do it. We have to do it. This plan has not changed. From the minute that Jesus spoke it till now, it has not changed. And say, so, well, what we need is more big crusade. What we need, no, what we need is to co-labor with Christ, every one of us, and see our friends and our family and our community transformed as we work with him. We don't need a better plan. The plan's already been given to us. What's the vision, Pastor? Go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, that don't sound like a big vision to me. It's a huge vision. We're talking about reaching millions of people for Jesus Christ. And we all can play our part. That's what he's called us into. My job here is not to um, create rotors. My job here is to release ministry. Rotors will fulfill a job, but ministry will change lives. Do not we say that again? I like that. I wrote that this morning. <laughs> I got up this morning and I thought, Lord, I need a little bit of something here. My job is not to create rotors. Well, I'm no good at admin anyway. Ask Claire. I'm no good at most things, but I'm definitely not good at making rotors. But my job is not to create rotors. And even if I was good at creating rotors, that will only allow us to fulfill jobs. But if I can impassion you and stir you up into ministry, it will change lives. And we want to be those kind of people, don't we? Taking the word of God, co-laboring with the Lord, and seeing things happen. Now, I didn't say that we don't need practical things sorting out. It's not all about laying hands on people and witnessing to people. But we can co-labor with Christ while we're making the coffee in the kitchen, can't we? We can co-labor with Christ when we're doing a handshake on the door. It always amazes me how the church put the ugliest people on the door. <laughs> not this morning, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have, you, have you ever, ever noticed when you shake hands with somebody on the door in the church you've never been to before and, and the hand's like a kipper? Like... <laughs> We, 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 don't, we don't want any of that. Give them a good handshake. Give them a hug and tell them Jesus loves them as they come through the door. As we co-labor with Christ, there should be something on the inside of us. You, you know, we, we need to co-labor with Christ even if we're on the door. What did David say? He was the king. He said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Bless the Lord. And we had two beautiful ladies on the door this morning. Just in case they decide to leave the church. <laughs> Change your glass. I believe we have a mandate from the Holy Spirit to co-labor with Christ. And uh, it's good we can laugh in church. It's good that we can feel relaxed. But we have a job afoot. 
I've said to the leaders, and I'll stand here again as I did last week, if you think I've got all the answers, you're sadly mistaken. We still have a pretty much blank piece of paper. We're here on a Sunday morning. And aren't you glad we're feeling the presence of God? Uh, Sunday mornings have been just beautiful the last 12 months. If you come to the prayer meeting on Tuesday and again on a Friday and when we pray just before the service, every time of session of prayer we have in this place is just beautiful. And we are touching the heart of God. But it's time to co-labor with Christ. What we've been praying for, what we've been encouraging each other to do, how we've been engaging in worship, that's just part of what God has called us into. Now we need to go and take the mandate of going out into all the world and preach the gospel. In two Sundays' time on the 16th, again, it's our plus one service. So I'm challenging you now, two weeks in advance. Think about somebody to ask, pray about it, and get them to church. I invited 40-odd people last time, and none of them turned up. But I've been co I, I did my part. It's no good moaning if you didn't play your part. I was a bit upset, of course I was. But I've played my part. I'm asking you to play your part. And together, we will see God do some incredible things. Now, are we some body parts missing? Yeah, we are. Are we some key ministries missing in this church? Absolutely. But as we start to function, you'll find that other people want to function alongside us, and God will draw people. I've prayed it for a long time, and I believe it. There are people on the other side of the world that are about to join this church. They just don't know it yet. We've never met them. The people from the other side of Birmingham, on the other side of here, there, and everywhere, that are on their way. But we, we want a church that can get plugged into. You know, we don't want to be the, the valley of dry bones and people go, oh, look, look at them bunch scattered over across the place. We want the breath of God to start to blow again, don't we? And they'll come a rattling and bringing together what God has purposed in our lives and in this place. So I'm excited about doing some stuff with Jesus. I don't know about you. Yeah. It seems better than running church to me. It seems better than having a few meetings when we start to co-labor with Jesus because he's the healer. He's the deliverer. He's the one who sets free. He's the one that's got all the answers. Isn't that wonderful? If I'm going to work with anybody, I want to work with a genius. And we're working with Jesus, and he's amazing. You know, you've been at work, and they put you with a dullard. Look, it's so bad. You know, they said, oh, he'll help you out. And you end up doing more work than when you started, because they're just clueless. Aren't you glad today that we're not standing with a co-worker who's clueless? We're standing with one that has all the answers, all the power, all the authority, and, and, and he loves us with all of his heart. And he's, he's pushing on so that we will... Learn to do things with him and enjoy it. The last thing we want to do is be a miserable church. We want to be working with Jesus, enjoying his presence. I've preached enough now. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you this morning that you have called us not to work for you. Although you could just tell us to do the things that you want us to do. But you've chosen to say, come alongside me. I want to use your hands. I want to use your mouth. I want to use your feet. I want to use your intelligence. I want to use your giftings. I want to use you. And so I just pray over this church today an incredible release of your blessing that we might work with you, that we might see in our community and in our families and in this area, this black country that we so desperately love, a move of the Holy Spirit. Lord, bring in many, many lives, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to worship the Lord in a final song and take up our offering. We'll stack the chairs at the end, if you would. Tea and coffee down the bottom. Got chocolate biscuits, praise the Lord. Let's just uh, stand and really just sing our hearts out and give him all the glory and all the honour that's due his name. Thanks, Sam. <laughs>
eternity. And there will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Who oh, standing face to face with he who died and rose again? Sing, holy, holy is the our faith, we sat through doubt and fear, but in the end, we will see that it was worth it, when he returns and wipes away our tears, oh, there will be a day when all will bow before Stand beside the heroes of the faith, and with one voice and a thousand generations, singing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain on that day. No one, every one of those heroes will cast their crowns before him and say, you are worthy because you were slain and you opened the book. You're worthy of opening the book and breaking your seals. There's no one like Jesus, is there? I love you, Lord. I know the boys practiced it earlier. Let's just sing a final song. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. And let's just, we know the words to this. You don't need to look at the screens, but let's just give him some praise from our hearts and some worship and adoration.
Bless you, Lord. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. We love you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I declare these words of scripture over you. You will go out with joy and be led forth in peace. And the mountains, the hills will break forth before you into singing. The trees of the fields will clap their hands. After that, he talks about an incredible move of God where things begin to spring forth in the desert and things begin to happen. We declare that over this congregation and over our lives. Lord, we want to work with you and we want to see growth. We want to see blessing. We want to see deliverance. We want to see healing. We want to see salvation in this place. And so, Lord, I pray that your blessing would remain with us now as we leave each other. That, Father, this week will be a great week in the purposes of God in this place. We pray for our nation right now. We pray for our Prime Minister, for the government, Lord Jesus. We pray, Lord Jesus, that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, good morning and God bless you all.